Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, wait, I guess that's what we're supposed to say all the time, right? Um, so this is a little bit of a kind of a culture shock for me right now. I just got back from Honduras. I'm involved with a small nonprofit that does eye surgery in Central America. And I just spent the week doing anesthetics with a Jackson Reese as my circuit, uh, coming from an oxygen tank with a propofol drip. And now we're going to talk about the nuances of maintaining uh, labor analgesia. It's a little bit different level of medicine. Um, let's see. So uh, I guess to start off again, I have no relevant uh, financial conflicts to disclose. And I also like to start off with my talks by giving you the, the, the ending. So you don't have to you know, wonder where I'm leading and it kind of, you know, understand kind of where, what I'm trying to get at. So we're going to start with the assumption uh, that lighter is better. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'm just going to show kind of one study that kind of proves the whole point that lighter blocks are better in terms of um, outcomes for the, uh, the labor. And, and then with that assumption, I'm going to talk about how changing to a program intermittent epidural bolus pump will improve your analgesia and satisfaction, decrease interventions, i.e., you know, how many times you have to go pop, uh, top up the woman. And then there is some effect on outcome probably, but it's going to be minor, if any. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that also. So, all right. So the thing is with lighter is better. That was actually a talk I gave probably 20 years ago uh, here at this meeting. And, and there's no one study that really shows that giving lighter blocks um, it, I mean, there's no definitive study that completely proves it, that it's 100% better to give lighter analgesia. But there's this preponderance of evidence from the randomized controlled trials, change of practice studies, meta-analyses. And, um, and from that, the Comet study uh, is really the study that really is our best evidence. Um, and so the Comet study is this study from, that looks at the effect of uh, going from the traditional uh, quarter percent epidural um, local you know, quarter percent bupivacaine epidurals that they used to use using intermittent bolus techniques where that means you, you had to go in every hour or two and re-bolus the woman versus um, infusion techniques. And they used um, with lighter anesthetics. And so they used two maternity units with you know, over a thousand women, so it was really well powered. And um, the primary outcome was spontaneous vaginal delivery. And they had one group that started out with the CSE, and, and then they were maintained with 10th percent bupivacaine with fentanyl and, and, and they, with an infusion. And then they had a low-dose epidural group, which is basically you have started the epidural with the 10th percent bupivacaine and fentanyl and then ran that same infusion. And then the intermittent bolus technique, which was a quarter percent bupivacaine, without the uh, local anesthetic, I mean, without the, without the opioid. So you're actually, um, you know, able to use much lighter um, local anesthetic concentrations by adding the fentanyl and uh, using it as an infusion technique, and that ended up having a significant effect on the outcomes of labor. Uh, as you can see here, that your spontaneous vaginal delivery rate and your uh, went, down, went down by using the intermittent bolus technique with the heavier local anesthetic, and then also your instrumental vaginal delivery rate went up. There was a trend towards a little bit higher um, C-section rate with the intermittent bolus technique, but uh, that did not prove to be statistical, statistically significant. So this comet study I kind of shows us overall what we see by, by giving lighter blocks where the woman can uh, push better, um, you do improve outcomes. And the key is adding opioids so that you get better analgesia um, with the lighter um, local anesthetic concentrations and then also using the in infusion technique so that you didn't have to go back so often so you feel more comfortable using the, um, the lighter local anesthetic techniques. And so that's kind of the overall picture of why, you know, where we got to, how we got to where we are now, which is light anesthetics with opioids within continuous infusions. 
So now I want to talk about the latest and greatest, which is uh, program intermittent epidural bolus pumps. Um, and what that, that is, is instead of a continuous infusion of local anesthetic, um, you, you get like a bolus every 30 to 45 or 60 minutes of, lo of local anesthetic that then hopefully works a little more, effective, more effectively than just having the uh, continuous infusion of the local anesthetic. Now, for a historical perspective, um, it's important to realize that the reason that the manual boluses went away versus the continuous, bolus, the continuous infusions is what that's supposed to say is actually, I'm sorry, just notice that now. Um, but the, um, what they found was when they studied that initially, the pain scores were about the same. Uh, there was very coarse pain sampling. They didn't really do a very good job of looking at it. Um, and then um, they actually found less or equal motor block in the t continuous groups because they were able to use the le less concentrated local anesthetics. Now, it wasn't thoroughly studied because it didn't take long for people to realize it was a lot more convenient just to put a person on a continuous pump than to have to manually go in and bolus every once in a while. Um, but now we're, we're looking at more of the evidence that maybe this intermittent bolus technique is a little bit better. And this has really um, come about through several mechanisms. First of all, it's everybody's clinical observation when you had continuous infusions going, um, you'd have a patient that would have breakthrough pain and you go bolus them with, with very light doses, but um, th then all of a sudden the epidural would work again. And, and there were these patients that were just problematic that just required epidural boluses as opposed to the infusion. And we always wonder, well, maybe the bolus just spreads the local anesthetic better in that patient. Um, and then there was a study by Manny Vallejo here, um, and I think that kind of showed initially that when you use PCEA alone, uh, that you had similar outcomes with pain, and, uh, but you used lo less local anesthetic. Again, suggesting that by the patient self-administering their intermittent boluses, you got better coverage than with continuous infusion techniques. So, um, and then there's this really nice breakthrough study that kind of really showed it. And this is with gynecological surgery for post-operative pain, and they used low thoracic epidurals with um, three-quarters percent bupivacaine. And there were two groups that they looked at. Um, one got in continuous infusion of just three mils an hour, and then the other one got in intermittent epidural boluses. And now these were just really small boluses, one mil every 20 minutes. Not, it doesn't seem like a, much of a change, but if you look at the, um, on, on the graph, you can see that the, um, the, the sequential boluses, the SEB group, uh, you can see, if you just look at the gestalt there, you can see that the, the lower and upper limits of the block are much wider than in the continuous epidural infusion group. So you can see that effectively, you cover many more dermatones using this intermittent bolus technique um, compared to the continuous infusion. And then, um, and then it became popular to study it before we had commercial pumps that were available. Um, it was studied in academic institutions. And, and when they looked at the dose of local anesthetic, you can see with this meta-analysis of, of studies that looked at on the um, left side, you can see that the intermittent epidural bolus, that it, it tended to use just a slightly less local anesthetic. Now we're talking about one milligram of bupivacaine an hour difference, really. And, and, the, and the graph on the right, it just, they've taken out the one study that's quite a, an outlier, and it also used different concentrations in the two groups. And you take that out, and it's still significant. Again, it's a really small difference but it does point out the fact that um, using a, a you know, intermittent bolus technique, that you actually are uh, a little bit more efficient. Now, why is using less local anesthetic important? Um, well, it, it shows that the PIB is more, more efficient, but it's really not clinically significant in and by itself. So what do I care about? You know, well, I want to know, 
can pa patients have less pain and be more satisfied if, they, if I switch to these pumps? And is there going to be less motor block, which will hopefully increase the spontaneous vaginal delivery rate and shorten the second stage of labor and maybe have fewer interventions? Maybe the epidurals will work better. I'll have to uh, intervene fewer uh, times and maybe hopefully replace fewer catheters. Well, you know, what do my colleagues care about? You know, will this pump allow me to sleep more? And, okay. So let's look at patient satisfaction, not Brendan and Alex's satisfaction. Um, but if you look at the meta-analysis by George um, up in Canada, and what he found was that, um, that patients were, were more satisfied uh, in, the, in five of the studies that measured uh, satisfaction in the meta-analysis. Now, you look at that and you're going, well, you know, you're moving up the average satisfaction by six or seven points, and you're thinking, eh, not, not a big thing. Well, it's important to remember every study that you've, we've showed satisfaction scores up to, to now, the, the satisfaction rate is like at 90% to begin with, with just a continuous maintenance of the labor epidural. Now, um, if you move the needle significantly from when you're already at 90%, that's really great. That's really hard to do any better than 90%. So the fact that um, satisfaction has gone up a few points here actually is meaningful. And then if you look at pain, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like in this study, um, you can actually see that you know, after two or three hours when you know, your, your maintenance part of your epidural has kicked in, the patients actually have a little higher pain score. Now this is not a graph that shows the pain score all the way from zero to 100. It just shows zero to 30. So you're looking at like a 10 point difference here. So it's not that big a difference, uh, but it is a little bit uh, more pain in the uh, PIB group. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, However, in the other studies, um, you can see that it's pretty much the same pain scores with the two groups. And the difference, though, is like when you look at these studies, the one study used a little bit higher concentration of bupivacaine, um, and the, um, but, but both groups really showed less local anesthetic and manual boluses in the PIB group. And I think that's really an important point. Somehow the patients weren't tight, you know, in the PIB group in that one study that had more pain, they weren't titrating themselves up to more analgesia. They were satisfied with the pain relief they were getting. So I think overall what this shows is that you're able to um, get adequate analgesia as, as good as, as you can with continuous using PIB and even in studies that might not have shown quite as good a pain relief, patients are satisfied and that's where they want to be. Um, now, the problem with the, with the research up to this point um, that I've shown you is it's meta-analyses of all these small studies that had like 80 patients per study uh, on average. And um, when, we, uh, when the commercial pumps became available and we introduced them at Stanford, we wanted to see what impact we were having. Um, and so we changed from, when we, we, we changed from clinical, um, I mean from continuous epidurals to, to program epidural boluses, uh, we ended up keeping the same hourly rate of our um, local anesthetic, but it was nine mils every 45 minutes instead of 12 mils every hour with the continuous. And we didn't measure the PCA bolusing, but we really wanted to look at just the outcomes. Um, and, and I really believe in these impact studies as ways to evaluate what happens in your practice, and we should all be doing them, whether in private practice or academics, and because they're great studies because they give us the real outcomes that we're interested in, and we, you can have large uh, sample sizes, like this study that I'm about to present that was done by Christine McKenzie at our um, institution actually had... Um, you know, as many patients as the whole meta-analysis that, that was available at the time when this was published. Um, and what we found was that the, um, the pain scores um, before they got their epidurals was exactly the same in the two groups um, 
before and after the intervention, and that, and that we made them initially comfortable uh, the same, to the same level um, after the intervention. But what we really noticed was that the highest uh, pain score um, measured on a scale from zero to 10 was significantly lower. Um, you know, the, the median pain score was zero in the PIB group versus in the continuous group was our mean pain score before was, was two. So we actually did a really good job of, of lowering the maximum pain score that we saw from, you know, after we started the epidural until they got to the second stage. Now, the, the interesting part of that is, is if you look at this, um, if you look at verbal pain score distributions and by percentage, you can see what we did was we increased the percentage of women uh, who had pain scores of zero. So we're doing a good job of kind of just improving um, that lower end of pain. You know, it's, the people who are having lots of pain where the epidural isn't working or whatever, we're not, we're not fixing that with PIB, but we're really improving the people, the maintenance of the, of the pain analgesia when uh, we're not necessarily in the room actively managing their pain. Um, now, another important outcome that we're all interested in is not having to go back and fix up the block so much. And, um, you know, if you look again on the left, you can see the percentage of patients that require a, a physician bolus. And you can see that it's, you know, the, it's about 5 or 10% improved uh, in, in the meta-analysis uh, by having uh, the, the PIB program as opposed to the continuous program. And um, now, in terms of time to first intervention, that didn't change. Um, and that's probably more of a reflection of, you know, the early interventions are when the, the catheter isn't working at all, the bolus didn't work, and you're changing the catheter then. But it's the later interventions that we seem to um, decrease the number of times that you have to go in and, and make a bolus. And if you look at all the studies that are listed in that meta-analysis, and you look at the number of manual boluses, uh, you can see that um, in no case was it better to be in the continuous group in any of the studies, uh, but the number of manual boluses required was reduced in, in, in several studies. Um, and, and even the time to first manual bolus was increased a little bit in the continuous group. Um, so that overall, the, the preponderance of evidence is that you're going to have to intervene less with your patients if you use a programmed intermittent epidural bolus technique or pump. Um, and then going back to our study, what we'll, you know, Christine's study at Stanford, if you look at the percentage of patients that required clinician boluses, we dropped it from about 19% to 12%, which is about a 7% improvement. Uh, which is really significant. Um, you know, that, that makes the number, of, you, you, you definitely notice it since we switched to the pumps, how different it is, how often we have to go in and bolus the patient. And even more importantly, the number of unilateral blocks that we see has decreased. And that's probably because by having the, we, we probably don't get as frustrated with the catheters by having better distribution of the drug in the epidural space throughout the labor, we're less likely to have to replace the blocks with, or see unilateral blocks that we have to go and bolus um, by having um, the intermittent bolus pumps. And also, the number of times that we have to go in and give a second bolus to the patient is also decreased by using the PIB pump. So, uh, in this other study. This isn't ours, this is another study, but if you can see the number of patients that required one or two boluses, you really see the significance in the times that you have to go and fix up the block multiple times in the patients um, by, by using the PIB pump. Now, this is the more controversial part of the, the issue, is are we really affecting the outcome of labor? I showed you earlier the Comet study, which is probably the most dramatic in, you know, difference between like light blocks and heavy blocks, and you can see that we didn't really affect the cesarean delivery rate, and we did drop the, um, 
instrumental vaginal delivery rates significantly by using lighter blocks. But again, it's not like 50%. We've dropped it, you know, 10 or 20%. Um, now, can using the same light techniques and by giving this new different way of giving the, the drugs, is that really going to make a significant difference? And you can see that um, on the left side, the cesarean delivery rate was not affected uh, by using PIB. And I, we really, really wouldn't expect that difference to, to happen, I, I don't think. Um, however, um, the instrumental vaginal delivery rate was affected um, by using PIB um, in the, in the meta-analysis that they found. Now, the problem with, that, with saying that is it turns out that the, this outcome is strongly affected by the one study from Italy uh, at the top there. Uh, and that's the, the study that also had about 30% of the patients for the whole meta-analysis. So it's the outcome, this instrumental vaginal delivery rate improvement um, was really affected by one study. And, um, and to give you an example of why we shouldn't get excited about one study, you know, being an outlier in, in the outcome of labor studies is this study back at looking at a meta-analysis of cesarean delivery rates in uh, epidurals versus parental opioids. And if you look at that, there's this one study down at the bottom, the Thorpe study from 1993, that was uh, a major controversy in its day. And it was one of the earliest studies. And it was a randomized controlled trial of epidural versus um, uh, IV, I think it was fentanyl, uh, for analgesia. And it showed that the cesarean delivery rate was 14 times greater um, in the um, in the epidural group. Now, multiple other studies, as you can see in this meta-analysis, showed that it's really not, um, you know, that, we, that this was just an outlier type study. But that's why we shouldn't, on the other hand, get so excited about having an outlier that favors a new technology that we're using to deliver labor analgesia. But there is a, you know, there is that slight hint that you get a little bit less motor block and maybe we'll, we're having a positive effect by switching to PIB, but I don't think that the um, jury is quite in on that yet. Now, on the duration of labor, um, it's interesting that if you look at the studies that used PCEA versus uh, studies that just didn't have a PCEA function added on to the PIB, that the PCEA studies didn't show a uh, difference um, in the uh, duration of labor. But in the non-PCA studies, they actually did show a, a difference. Um, and, and maybe that's because by not giving the patients, you know, complete access to giving themselves too much of a motor block, they were actually able to push better and shorten the second stage of delivery. It's unclear. Uh, and, you know, again, we need more data. But again, it does favor um, PIB again. Now, in terms of the second stage of labor, um, with the, there were only five, five or six studies that measured that, and it did seem that, that there was a shorter duration of the second stage of labor in the PIB group compared to the continuous group. So it seems like we're getting better distribution of the drug uh, and, and not concentrating it in areas where you end up with more of a motor block by using the programmed epidural and intermittent bolus techniques. So. Um, I would say that if I was going to summarize the outcome of labor uh, section of this talk is that um, I think it does have an effect uh, to, to maybe improve outcomes, but really it's, it's how you manage the labor is, is the key. Um, first of all, you know, I keep going back to the fact that we already know that using um, less concentrated local anesthetics are important and that there may be an effect of giving patients too much access to the PCEA function that might affect the duration of labor. Um, and then also remember how OBs manage um, the labor is going to have an effect on the outcome, probably to a greater degree of the technology that you're using. So you might want to see what effect 
adding PIB to your hospital has on your own individual practice. Um, and I would say that this data is intriguing, but I'm not completely convinced. But clearly, we're not making the situation worse by using PIB versus CE, uh, continuous in infusions. So what's the optimal dosing? Um, and this is really hard to say. Um, I, I think I really couldn't see a consensus in the literature or, or data that I felt was convincing enough to present that this is the actual uh, duration that we should use and what, what milligrams you should be using. Um, we felt like an hour was too long, and I think there is some data in the literature that supports the idea that you know, making your program uh, bolus an hour uh, is probably too long. 45 minutes uh, is probably the longest it should be. Um, it made sense to us to use 45 minutes. And, now, and it seems a little more optimal. 30 minutes seemed a little bit too short, but that, that's probably adequate also. I think we're going to, before we can give you the final answer on that, we have to have more data. But I think um, if you do make the conversion from going from continuous pumps to PIB, that you should use the same local anesthetic dosing uh, per hour that you were using with continuous. And I say that if you're using light local anesthetics. Um, the, the most important change you can make is to go to light an local anesthetics as opposed to the heavier doses. If you're not using light local anesthetics, do that first before you invest in the PIB pumps. Um, now, the one issue is there was a, the, the issue of safety, and everybody was a little bit worried about the fact that um, what if you have, you have an untested catheter if you've done a CSE and you haven't tested the catheter and, you, and then you start this PIB uh, pump and uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes later, you're going to have this bolus of up to 6 milligrams, 8 milligrams of bupivacaine going in all at once. And um, I think it's really important that whatever parameters you use, you should shorten the interval and lighten the dose so that you're not delivering more than 6, maybe up to 8 milligrams of bupivacaine in one bolus just in case um, you do get an intrathecal bolus of this local anesthetic. And, and it's important to remember that even in an untested catheter, that may seem less, that may seem, well, a tested catheter may seem really safe, but we actually had a uh, case report that we've just put out where we um, were looking at a woman who had like three or four boluses, and then on like the fourth bolus that came out, she developed a, a complete motor block. And up until that point, she had been moving her legs and really hadn't had any signs of an intrathecal catheter. So these ca catheters do migrate. And um, so even having a tested catheter doesn't guarantee that your catheter isn't going to be intrathecal a couple hours later. So whatever um, regimen you come up with, it's really important uh, that you have the same diligent monitoring with the PIB program that you've had with the continuous program where you're always assessing the motor block and, and you're not leaving these patients alone and unmonitored for any significant amount of time. And then, um, so you've got to really involve the nurses uh, that can report if there's any changes and make sure your nurses are up to snuff of really monitoring patients appropriately, whether you're using a continuous technique or a PIB, PIB technique. But if you're using the, the intermittent bolus uh, pumps, I do think it does behoove you to um, be aware that there can be a more sudden change than if you're using the continuous technique. So if I'm going to summarize here, I would say that there's no data point that is convincing um, or no study that's completely convincing that this is a huge change, um, but there is good mechanistic data that shows that you get better coverage. And the preponderance of evidence really, and, and it's really consistent uh, outcomes across many studies uh, that show that pain's slightly better treated, the satisfaction uh, scores are better, and the interventions um, are going to be slightly less. S jury's still out on the labor outcomes, but not a negative. And um, I think all these slightly betters add up to very significant. Uh, very significant improvement. And I see Brendan coming up, and I'm done.